Welcome back to this installment of the Society for Participatory Medicine. This is John Hoban, and I'm uh, very fortunate to be joined with uh, Nancy Finn today. Nancy's written a book on participatory medicine, and uh, we're going to dig a little bit more into that, but also to get Nancy's perspective, as she's been in a leadership position uh, within the media committee for the Society for a couple of years now, and, uh, and also I wanted to get Nancy's perspective because she has a, a unique story with uh, some of the uh, precision medicine initiatives that have been announced in the last couple of weeks. So, Nancy, uh, tell me a little bit about the book. Uh, I have not read your book, but I did download it, and I'm looking forward to uh, to reading it. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, I my background uh, was in uh, technology and marketing, and when I decided to retire from corporate America, I wanted to write a book, and I did a lot of interviews and uh, discovered that the healthcare field, my training is so I approached it as a journalist would, doing lots of interviews. And my findings were that the healthcare field, you know, was really way behind the rest of the world in terms of implementing communication technology, digital communication technology specifically, in the way in which healthcare as an industry operates and the way people um, engage and interact. So uh, the book I... Um, I wrote two books, actually. One uh, initially was for doctors, published by Springer, called oh. Digital Communication in Medicine. Um, and the second, which is the book you're referring to, is called Eat Patients, <laughs> Live Longer, The Complete Guide to Managing Your Healthcare Using Technology. And the um, theory behind that book is basically that patients really um, haven't had the opportunity until they to engage and communicate effectively with their providers. Um, when I wrote this book in 2011, uh, and prior to that, the world of healthcare was, you know, patient goes to the doctor, doctor tells them what the diagnosis is, what the medication is, uh, patient goes home, patient either adheres or does not adhere to what the doctor has said. That's not the really the way it should be. It should be much more participatory, much more interactive between the patient and the provider. So the thrust of my book is to walk patients through all of the ways they can use some of the technology that they use each and every day, <laughs> email, the internet, um, databases, uh, social networks, like Facebook that patients were already on, etc., to walk them through how they can use that and apply it to managing their own health care in a way, because um, as things have evolved, even since I wrote the book, patients are more and more uh, forced to manage their own care for both uh, financial reasons and um, other reasons. I mean, doctors allocate you a 15-minute, if you're lucky, visit annually, and uh, beyond that, you know, the patient goes home and they have to figure out kind of what to do and how to do it. So my book provides the resources for patients to get the kind of information they need to help them uh, figure out how to manage their care and how to approach their doctor. I go through very basic lists of um, what are the questions you should bring into your visit with your doctor? Um, mm -hmm. What are the basic apps? What are the good websites out there that will help you manage care? Um, where can telemedicine, long distance care, fit in to the scheme of things for second, con you know, second opinion consults? Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's basically the thrust of the book for patients and the reason I wrote it. And since I wrote the book, I uh, I have a website and I write lots and lots of blog posts on every conceivable subject that patients would be interested in uh, from transparency and pricing of procedures to, um, uh, again, you know, how to use wearables to manage and monitor your chronic condition. Excellent. Really participatory. Very participatory. Excellent. Well, uh, we are definitely fortunate to have you in a uh, leadership position with the society. And uh, I wanted to uh, cut over to some of the, the latest uh, participatory aspects you had mentioned uh, in terms of genetic testing, you had mentioned that you personally had some testing 
done. And uh, with the, did you catch Dr. Francis Collins' announcement the week before last with the acceptance I, of the I, reporting? I did um, have a chance to look at it. Um, and yes, I I had uh, breast cancer, um, and my sister had had breast cancer, and other members of my family had had cancers of various types. And so um, I inquired at Mass General as to whether it would be um, prudent to have the BRCA tests, which they uh, did agree to. Um, fortunately, I was BRCA negative, um, so I didn't have to uh, deal with all of the um, surgeries that one would need. They were BRCA positive. But um, I've also followed the personalized medicine world for a long time. Uh, attended conferences, uh, written about this, uh, thought about it a lot. I bring it into almost every presentation I do in terms of um, indicating to, to my audience that I feel that personalized medicine is one of those revolutions um, that is going to change the way healthcare is delivered to patients because um, there will be the ability through genetic and genomic um, discoveries to tailor uh, the delivery of a specific uh, treatment to an individual patient. And I certainly believe that that's going to change things quite a bit. Absolutely. I've just seen uh, recently a couple of companies that are doing the pharmacogenomic aspects of uh, precision medicine. And uh, that's quite, a, quite an eye-opener to see how nine specific genomes then control the metabolism of majority over 200 or 300 medications. So that seems to be an exciting area as well uh, outside of the uh, oncological area. Oh, there's a lot in personalized medicine that isn't just going to, to uh, be targeted to oncology, but to many of the neurological conditions and diseases that we know. Um, uh, many of the um, Many of the aging conditions like Alzheimer's and dementia eventually will be impacted. Um, many of the, the things that kids deal with, um, autism, Asperger's, ADHD. Um, I do believe that personalized medicine eventually, over time, will be able to identify the variations in an individual uh, biomarker or genome and be able to um, change the way in which these individuals are uh, dealt with and treated and, and um, the pathways that they follow in their lives. So yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I find it very interesting um, that the new buzzword is precision medicine. Personalized medicine has been around now for two decades or longer. And um, I, as a matter of fact, I very recently did some research to look for the, def the de definitions of each and the unique differences and um, there aren't any. <laughs> Basically personalized medicine, precision medicine, which was coined by the political world, um, are very much the same. So uh, I think for people to understand that, that there's not a huge um, variation or two different movements going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think personalized medicine is a little more focused on the genome sequencing and precision medicine is more focused on the delivery with the genome sequencing, the delivery of what type of treatment. So it's a different um, aspect of one huge, huge area. Good points. What would you recommend a, a consumer that is uh, outside of the health delivery system, uh, what should they be doing or considering or positioning uh, to to make sure that they're working with their primary care physician and specialty physicians, uh, either if they do or do not have a chronic condition? What's what's kind of the general uh, words of advice you could give to a consumer to to take care of their family and be able to be positioned well uh, in this new personalized precision medicine realm? Well. I think the most important thing that a person um, has to evaluate about their health care delivery is uh, whether or not they're satisfied and feel they can communicate appropriately with their provider team. Um, I think that's critical. If they have that kind of open communication, um, 
and a free to ask questions and and the responses they are looking for, then everything else will follow. But if I know so many people who are frustrated with the individuals that they are dealing with and um, don't know what to do. I mean, my advice, frankly, is, you know, find another primary care provider that, you know, will communicate with you, will answer your questions, will give you that added time that you need. And so much of that time doesn't have to be in the office. So much of it can be virtual. And another piece of advice I give patients is that, you know, patients have to be astute about using the technology that they have at their fingertips to um, do some of the legwork themselves and to manage and monitor their conditions themselves. Uh, it's not going to happen for you longer. You have to be an active participant in that um, health care situation. What uh, good points. And what I'm thinking about uh, some folks I've talked to that uh, they they like their provider, they like their primary care physician, but the primary care physician has been uh, right in the crosshairs of the business and medicine. So a lot of what they're going to recommend or not recommend, uh, which would be outside the guidelines of a payer's guidelines, uh, what's the best way to, to be able to, to be an advocate and to get around the, uh, the health insurance policies that are immediate responses not to reimburse some of these advanced uh, testing that ultimately could have a, a significant impact on quality and uh, quantity of life? I mean, that's a huge question, and there is no one best way because it's a, it's a very difficult situation that exists for everybody today. Um, the, most important, um, the most important recommendation I can make to people is to be on top of, of what's going on and be on top specifically of whatever is recommended to you, be on top of what it's going to cost you. I think where things get really sticky and nasty for patients is um, when they're in a situation, they have a problem, the doctor recommends a treatment. Most doctors themselves are not, um, and to their defense, they don't have the time, most doctors themselves are not up on what it costs to have an MRI or to have a colonoscopy or to call an endoscopy or to have any sort of procedure. They don't know the cost. They know the patient needs it and they recommend it. And then the patient um, who's dealing with, you know, the illness as well as the worry about how to pay for this, it's not covered by insurance, um, has to sort of ferret through all this complicated information to find out what is their payment, what is their co-payment, what are they going to be responsible for. And then there are nuances about all of this. If you're readmitted to the hospital and you go to rehab and you you know you're not you might not be paid for or if you're in observation status in the hospital you definitely won't be um, compensated for any postal uh, you know care when you're released I mean there are a lot of complicated issues that are constantly changing CMS rules are constantly changing and um, CMS kind of sets the standards for all the payers what they cover typically, the other payers tend to cover as well. Um, so it's it's a very complicated issue, and it's very hard for patients, especially those who are in the middle of coping with just the frightening thought they have a serious illness, um, to have to figure out you know how they're going to uh, pay for these things and and uh, what their insurance company policies are, etc. You know, I, I think the answer to that, uh, and my best advice is the patient, and I've had this experience myself, the patient has to be um, free to pick up the phone and make those phone calls to the payers, to the doctors, to the hospital um, accounting offices, find out up front what these things are going to cost them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think my advice is the patient has to be very proactive. Yeah. Well, and I've seen, yeah, and I've seen some scenarios where uh, certain members of certain percentage of the uh, society participates in the listserv, 
and we'll put out a uh, question about Lyme disease or uh-huh. a question about some specific area, and then lo and behold, just through the dynamics of social media, through something as simple and uh, arcane as a list server, uh, you end up getting someone to a specialist in a certain part of the world for a specific condition right. with these right. guidelines. So I know the uh, the society's been very valuable just in that one little instance when somebody's uh, putting a call out for help and they're not a, they're a lay person, just a regular folks, and uh, are not familiar with navigating the health system and having folks like you and and others that are uh, more uh, more uh, experienced in navigating as guides is uh, is just a very valuable resource as part of the society. Well, we do have a number of patients as members, but we also do have a number of patient advocates who are very astute and can help people find the pathways that they need to take in order to get this kind of information for themselves. So, um, yes, yes, I agree. This service is extremely valuable um, in helping patients uh, that have an issue to navigate how to resolve some of those uh, very pesky questions about payments and treatments and so forth. I mean, even in the treatment arena, there's, you know, for any given um, cancer, for example, there's so many different varieties and approaches to how to treat. And oftentimes your physician, who's a very good physician, will give you a choice. Well, do you want I mean, I had breast cancer. The first thing I was asked, do I want a lumpectomy? Do I want a mastectomy? What are the pros? What are the cons? I mean, you're weighing and measuring this when you're sitting there still shocked to hear that you even have a problem. Right. So um, there are a lot of resources, and the society has been uh, very aggressive in trying to help people um, filter through some of that information. Exactly. Having a network of patient advocates is key, and that's a, a big value of the resource of, of the society, which uh, I greatly appreciate your uh, advice and counsel and your perspective. And uh, any parting thoughts as we uh, sign off for today, Nancy? Um, I mean, you know, just again reiterating that every patient has to be their own advocate or have a caretaker, a friend, family member who can help them advocate. Um, don't make any presumptions. I agree with the advice that um, is going around these days um, that, you know, if you possibly can, bring somebody to an appointment with you if you're dealing with a highly um, specialized area because you often will miss something that your friend will catch. In between you, you'll hear what you need to hear to make sure that you're uh, getting the best possible advice safest possible practice Mm -hmm. good advice and uh, join the society so you can network with other patient advocates well that's right absolutely Absolutely. fantastic Nancy Finn thank you so much for joining us today and again uh, what's the best way to reach you by email by email is nfinn finn at comcast dot net excellent thank you so much Nancy this is John Hoban signing off for the Society for Participatory Medicine Thank you. Thank you.